Good afternoon. Welcome to this afternoon's special finance and capital committee meeting. I'm Chairman Steve McMillan. Thank you for joining us. Since this is our only meeting today, I'd like to ask the Board Corporate Secretary to call the roll. Ms. Ellison. Chair McMillan. Here. Vice Chair Slater. Present. Director Smedberg. Present. Director Babers. Here. Alternate Director Rouse. Present. Director Present. Goldman. Present. And Director Letourneau. Here. Mr. Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you. Our first order of business is to approve the agenda. If there are no objections, we'll consider the agenda approved as presented. Hearing no objections, the agenda is approved. And uh, now we have uh, the minutes for our May 13th meeting before us for approval. Are there any objections to the minutes as presented? Hearing none, we will consider the minutes approved as presented. Uh, today we have one item on the agenda. It's a discussion of possible service and fare changes to help support the region as it continues its recovery from the pandemic. As new post-pandemic travel patterns emerge, Metro is seeking to support this new normal ridership with service and fare concepts that better meet the needs of existing riders, reflect new travel patterns, and attract returning and new customers. The, these changes, some of which could be implemented by the end of the summer, would build on already approved service enhancements that will begin on June 6th. Uh, at this point, I will turn the floor over to Mr. Wiedefeld and his staff to begin our presentation. Uh, before I do that, uh, Mr. Wiedefeld, do you have a rough estimate of how long the presentation is likely to take? Um, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, probably 20 to 25 minutes. Okay, thanks. Uh, we do have uh, one board member with a time constraint, and um, uh, we'll be sure to we'll be make sure that uh, excuse me, we'll make sure he can uh, uh, say his piece um, uh, before he has to leave. Okay, uh, with that, uh, I would ask staff to introduce themselves when presenting and ask everyone else to turn off their camera and mute their microphones when they're not speaking. Um, Mr. Wiedefeld. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be very brief since we do have time constraint. But as the board has requested, we come in with some options for service and uh, for fares, really to both attract previous riders, to attract new riders, and to support the economic development and the social, you know, the social environment that we that we support as the agency. Um, as we've been discussing through the whole budget process over the last few months, you know, we need, need to remain flexible, uh, and this would re this would reflect that, right? That things are changing around this fairly quickly, and we want to start to anticipate what we can do again to to improve service where we can. Um, <clears throat> we're looking at things potentially in the fall, and then obviously again in in January. Um, the briefing today will basically lay out different options for you to consider, um, and it's built on some of the information we heard during the budgeting process and obviously through the through the board hearings. So with that, I will now turn it over to Tom uh, so that he can start his presentation to keep us moving. Tom Webster. Thank you, Paul, um, and uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, my name is Tom Webster. I'm Executive Vice President for Strategy Planning and Program Management, and I believe the presentation is loading. Um, should be there now. Thank you. So um, the purpose of today's presentation um, is to provide information and considerations on uh, potential service and fare concepts uh, to support recovery in the region, including potential changes for implementation in the fall, as well as uh, to begin discussing potential longer-term uh, opportunities. Metro's pandemic recovery plan focuses, focuses on supporting uh, the region's recovery and planning for service that protects employees and customers and stays ahead of demand. Metro's recovery plan has five phases, and we're now in that uh, recovery phase with vaccines widely available and case rates declining. We're looking at opportunities where Metro can uh, support increased activity uh, during the region's recovery. And of course, as we all know, um, the Washington area is rapidly reopening. Uh, many restrictions were lifted last month and um, many or most of the remaining restrictions will largely, largely be removed uh, in the month of June. And school systems throughout the region have announced um, they will be reopening in the fall. 
This chart shows uh, the general trend of bus and rail ridership uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, ridership has increased in recent weeks, uh, but remains uh, low compared to pre-pandemic levels. Um, the charts on the right show uh, the distribution of ridership on bus and, and rail um, ac across the, the hours of the day. Um, and both bus and rail have seen uh, ridership balanced across the hours of day uh, as compared to the pre-pandemic when it had a much more peak-oriented uh, uh, distribution. In addition to our ridership, we've also been monitoring um, a few indicators of um, regional activity levels. Um, traffic is about 73% uh, of uh, normal as of February, but with different patterns than before. Um, there's less traffic early in the mornings and a higher share in the afternoons. Uh, restaurants are at about 50% of normal activity and are increasing uh, rather quickly uh, in recent days. Our area is still below the level um, of, of activity in, in, in restaurants um, uh, across the country, um, but it's consistent with the general trend of our region being relatively cautious during the pandemic. Office occupancy is at about 24% of normal uh, with lower numbers in the district uh, than in the surrounding jurisdictions. And of course, office occupancy has, has traditionally been a, um, a driver and in, or an indicator of our peak period ridership. Downtown's uh, daily population um, is about 26% of normal. Uh, this measure includes people uh, downtown for non-office work, eating, shopping, attending, event, and, um, attending events. Um, and while there's a lot of uncertainty, uh, we don't know what will happen or when it will happen. Um, we do expect a continuation of the trend of different types of activities resuming at different rates. Uh, for example, the return to offices and peak period travel could lag behind um, a full resumption of other activities like dining, shopping, sporting events, concerts, and other social and community event-related travel. Briefly, a, a summary of our current approved service levels uh, for FY22. Of course, earlier this spring, the board adopted the FY22 budget. Uh, we'll be running approximately 80% of pre-pandemic rail service levels. And with the approved changes um, on bus implemented in June and September, we will be running approximately 85% of pre-pandemic uh, Metro bus service levels. The goal um, of the changes taking effect in June is to maximize coverage throughout the week, including evening hours with some Metro bus uh, service extended uh, until 2 a.m. and um, some weekend improvements. To put that on a uh, on a timeline, um, so in uh, customers will see improvements um, in this in this baseline scenario with with no additional changes. Uh, beginning in Sunday, June sixth, uh, Metrobus customers will have more options with 34 routes restored to 2 a.m. service seven days a week, and other routes will see restorations, and all about 60 routes will see improvements. And um, of course, next year we will see uh, the planned uh, opening of the Silver Line stations as well as the Potomac Yard uh, new infill station. Uh, I'm now going to turn it over to um, Dennis Anasike, our, our Chief Financial Officer, who will discuss our current budget outlook. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Metro has relied on federal relief funding uh, since fiscal year 2020 in order to balance the budget. Overall, Metro has been allocated about $2.45 billion. And these funds have allowed Metro to maintain uh, service levels without laying off uh, employees. Uh, the key thing is that these funds are projected uh, to enable Metro to get through fiscal year 23 and perhaps some level of uh, fiscal year 2024 dependent on the level of recovery and suddenly on the level of bus and service, a rail service available on the streets. On the next slide, uh, this gives uh, the board or uh, the committee the uh, uh, amounts of funds available to Metro as well as the timeline for 
the utilization. Uh, as you can see on the left-hand side, the total column shows the SEM $2.45 billion, of which 221 was used in fiscal year 2020, 642 was used in 21, and the board has allocated uh, $723 million in fiscal year 22. In the aggregate, about $1.6 billion has been allocated, leaving $865 million available. As we look down the road, uh, what this slide shows are two uh, ridership scenarios. One is a little bit more aggressive than the other. Uh, scenario A assumes that ridership will be restored at 55% in uh, fiscal year 23 and 75% in fiscal year 24. Scenario B less pessimistic, uh, assuming 50% and 70% respectively in fiscal year 23 and 24. And these assumptions are based on what we are hearing from uh, other transit agencies, as well as the environments that Tom described earlier with respect to office reopenings and uh, uh, and rental outlook uh, in the marketplace. So based on this, if you look at the next slide, uh, this looks at the scenario A, which is much more optimistic. Uh, if, if this turns out to be the scenario that women Walmart is dealing with, then revenues over the next two fiscal years are projected at 428 and 563 respectively. If you factor in the expenses that are projected, including uh, contract cuts, uh, Silver Line and Potomac Yard, as well as others that uh, Tom uh, mentioned, it shows here what the subsidy levels will be with the assumption of a 3% growth. Uh, and therefore the level of relief funds that may be needed. In this scenario, it shows that Umada should have enough uh, resources available through 23, but will need additional resources in FY24 to the tune of about $190 million. On the next slide, which looks at the less optimistic ridership scenario, uh, we'll go through the same process. Uh, the revenue is slightly less, and therefore, in fiscal year 2024, uh, the remaining gap uh, will be much more significant, about $256 million. Uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to Tom. Thank you, Dennis. So now we'll move to um, potential service and fair concepts. Uh, there essentially three categories of policy questions and considerations that can provide uh, a framework for the board's choices going forward. Uh, first, on service, what, what level of service should Metro provide? Should Metro get back to 100% service levels from the current 80 to 85%? Should service be different than, than pre-pandemic service? Second, on fares, um, how do we best balance revenue, ridership, and equity goals? Um, and Third, on, on subsidy, how should federal relief funds be applied uh, through FY 2024? As staff have been uh, considering options to bring uh, to the board for consideration, uh, we recognize that there's an overall opportunity to offer uh, more frequent all-day bus and rail service. Uh, this concept would be uh, to move to a more consistent service offered seven days a week with an emphasis on setting a high standard for base all day service levels. Uh, the chart on the right uh, of this slide compares uh, the traditional focus on thinking about having uh, peak and off peak service with a different way of thinking about it. Uh, what if Metro offered a standard uh, or a high standard of all day service and then ran additional peak service on top of that uh, to meet higher demand during those times? Um, thinking about all these service as the main product rather than uh, the peak service uh, has been um, popularized uh, by, by transit um, experts and is really at the core of how a number of agencies across the country and internationally have looked at uh, recent, uh, particularly bus network redesigns. 
So building on this idea, uh, we developed a potential set of concepts to improve service frequency and also rail op opening hours. Um, an improvement we could make uh, that would have significant benefits for uh, a large number of customers and potential customers and also meaningful equity benefits for a region uh, would be to run more frequent service all day. Uh, the core of it could be a 26 line all day frequent service network across rail and bus, making rail frequencies more consistent in the evenings and weekends and upgrading many of the bus lines serving the most customers uh, to rail frequencies, rail level frequencies. Um, this would allocate pre-pandemic service hours not currently used. So between that 100% uh, of pre-pandemic level and 80 to 85% we're at today and, and going into FY22. Um, improving improving um, service frequency is uh, consistently rated a top priority for customers. Um, and this has been recently reconfirmed through our customer surveys and feedback sessions and um, on, on, on various service proposals and was a very clear finding coming out of uh, the bus transformation project. Um, and on rail opening hours, uh, Metro could phase in increase, increasing opening hours, uh, uh, starting by extending uh, opening times uh, uh, to midnight, uh, seven days a week and um, uh, by summer and until 1 a.m. on um, Friday and Saturday, I'm sorry, closing times. Uh, to further expand on this concept on rail, uh, this concept could include three changes, higher all day frequencies with improvements in evening and weekend frequencies, improved peak service frequency compared to today uh, to support uh, the return to work and school. And um, also importantly, at this frequency level, we would have uh, the capacity to operate 100% ACAR trains uh, to improve the customer experience. On bus, uh, this could include frequency improvements to 36 lines, benefit, benefiting about 60% uh, of bus riders. Uh, the frequency improvements would focus on uh, the hours between 7 a.m. and 9 p.m. Uh, buses will still operate at other times, uh, starting as early as 4 and running as late as uh, 2 a.m. Uh, these improved frequencies would be expected to increase ridership above recovery levels expected without any service improvements. Of course, estimates uh, in these uh, pandemic and, and recovery times are uh, very uncertain and unpredictable, but could be in the range of 8% uh, on, on these upgraded lines. And further on, on bus, under uh, this frequent service concept, we could improve service frequencies all day on 20 lines uh, to 12 minute. Um, so same as uh, the rail level frequencies. Uh, this would benefit about 43% or almost half of uh, existing bus riders. Uh, these lines uh, were chosen in this concept um, because they are the core of our framework service and carry a large number of riders, accounting for, like I said, almost half of our overall bus trips. Concept also emphasizes forming um, a very clear network, uh, improving suburb to suburb connections and improving service in places not uh, served by rail. Many of these lines serving uh, the most riders drop down to 20 or 30 minute frequencies during off peak times today. Um, and ridership on these lines is often spread out even more evenly throughout the day um, than the system as a whole. Uh, and, and of course we expect some additional benefits in terms of simplicity and dependability for customers and the ability to communicate this as an integrated network uh, between book rail and bus lines uh, with consistent service levels. Uh, Metro in the region could also look to make improvements to other lines uh, to serve a broader range of riders. Um, under the consistent service concept, an additional 16 bus lines could have service of 20 minutes or better all day, um, a significant improvement of where those lines are, uh, are, are today. Uh, and again, these lines were chosen because um, they're also an important part of the network and serve riders all day, um, but they do start from a lower baseline uh, ridership level, uh, both today and pre-pandemic, and the existing service frequency levels um, than, than those lines on the 12-minute the network concept. And this would, this would benefit a, a, about 17% of additional bus riders. 
We do have three examples of um, routes uh, in Virginia, uh, Maryland, and DC. Um, I will, in the interest of time, I will skip through these here, um, but they are available for your um, your review, and we can, uh, of course, answer questions um, on these specifics if you have them. So um, at the network level, uh, right now, riders on all rail lines with a double service pattern, um, such as the red line and other lines where um, the rail service overlaps. And riders on just three bus lines experience 12 minute or better service all week. This service concept would extend this to the whole rail system and to 20 bus lines and significantly increase the share of riders experiencing 12 minute or better service. Low income and minority riders would especially benefit from these potential service concepts, largely due to improvements in bus frequency, but also due to evening and weekend rail service improvements. The Council of Governments identifies equity emphasis areas, which are areas with a high proportion of low income or minority residents. Now, this frequent service concept would significantly increase the areas covered with service at a 12 minute standard from 17% um, today uh, to 45%, a 160% uh, a, a increase over, over where we are today. Um, this would expand to 61% air, to of areas uh, when, uh, when you factor in the 20 minute uh, service concept um, as well. Um, and importantly, the, these er the areas that are not covered here um, do still receive bus service, either provided by Metro or um, local operators in the region. Uh, Metro serves a, uh, about 83% of all equity emphasis areas uh, with rail or bus service, uh, with the remainder uh, provided by uh, local uh, bus operators. Um, this, these concepts will also serve uh, about 71% of the densest census blocks uh, with 12 minute service. This increases to 80% when um, uh, the 20 minute line concept is included. Um, and Metro serves uh, about 94% of the densest areas with rail or bus service uh, with the remainder served by other uh, transit operators. So these, um, Base service concepts for, for rail and bus are designed to stay within uh, pre-pandemic levels of service. On rail, these changes would be uh, neutral to pre-pandemic levels of service on weekdays with some additions on weekends. On bus, uh, the base concept allocates about 10% of the remaining 15% uh, of pre-pandemic service hours to frequency improvements. The other 5% would be reserved uh, to, to restore other services on other lines. Um, for consideration, we've also included estimates on the right hand side of this slide um, for the number of service hours required to make the service more frequent, um, span more hours of the day, or to include more lines. Of course, with additional resources above and beyond uh, pre pandemic levels, Metro and the region could do more. Uh, the potential opportunities include options to restore more pre-pandemic service, peak service, um, expand high frequency bus segments, add additional lines to the all day high frequency network, um, offer high frequency uh, during more hours of the day than, than is suggested here in this concept, um, or increase uh, the frequency standard. So um, rather than 12 minutes, uh, something like 10. Uh, um, as I mentioned uh, a few moments ago, um, the overall concepts work within uh, the remaining 15% of pre-pandemic bus service hours that not have, have not yet been restored. 10% um, would go to those frequency improvements and 5% would be allocated to other service restorations uh, in preparation for returning ridership. Some service uh, restorations would remain deferred on additional lines, um, and those are not included in the FY22 budget. In general, um, these are peak period 
uh, services and have um, overlapping uh, or other alternatives available in the area. And our, our team will um, continue to closely monitor. Um, we have generally tried to make sure we're still serving um, areas and that most of these routes, as I said, are, are overlays of other service. The, these um, services and, and, and changes would be revisited uh, under this concept as part of the FY23 budget process uh, starting this fall. Um, moving to fares, um, this concept uh, con considers uh, taking this in, in, in two steps. First, uh, moving on items that can be accomplished quickly, and then secondly, um, considering larger changes and the development of a new fare strategy for Metro and the region. On the near-term opportunities, this could include implementing the deferred fare changes uh, and changes recommended by the bus transformation project, um, uh, some of which were originally approved in the FY21 budget. This includes changes to the rail bus transfer discount, a cheaper weekly bus pass, incorporating regional providers in monthly passes and offering uh, $2 weekend uh, flat rail flat fares. Uh, these short-term opportunities would significantly advance um, integration and equity uh, for our customers and for the region um, and move us closer to offering uh, one regional transit system by eliminating that uh, transfer penalty. Um, we could also consider uh, promotional uh, fare period or fare opportunities that could offer discounted fares uh, for a defined period um, uh, to, to win riders and, and to welcome uh, uh, previous riders back to the system. Um, we're going to continue our implementation of our mobile initiative um, and uh, as well as um, low income fare pilots, um, which was uh, delayed uh, due, to, um, the, due to the pandemic. Um, and then as, 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 as a second tier and a longer term uh, uh, discussion, we would support uh, the board's consideration of larger changes and uh, the development of a new fair strategy. Uh, this would include uh, staff support and, and development of specific concepts and, and of course, seeking customer, public and, and stakeholder input. Um, the current fair policy principles uh, were adopted by the board uh, more than a decade ago now. Um, and you know the board could consider updating those fair policy principles as part of this longer term discussion. Um, in an internal uh, working group uh, developed a draft update to those fair policy principles. Um, and that could be the, the, the beginning of a, of a conversation about uh, a framework to de guide decisions about um, the fares and, and the customer experience. So um, in, in undertaking this effort and, and some of the longer term uh, concepts and for consideration in the FY23 budget, here we've listed um, some of the ideas that, uh, that the board has had or stakeholders in the region um, or that we've looked at as, as a staff. Um, so just to give you a, a preview of what, um, what the board could consider uh, this summer, fall and going into the next year. I'll now turn it over to my colleague Lynn Bowersox um, to discuss uh, uh, some customer facing items. Thanks. Excuse Lynn. me, Lynn, uh, this is uh, the chairman. Uh, before you begin, uh, Mr. Goldman, I see from the clock we are past 3.30 now. Uh, would you like to comment or ask questions on any material presented so far, or would you prefer to wait till the end of the presentation? No, I would appreciate the um, opportunity to comment, uh, unfortunately, um, something has come up, uh, another commitment. I will have to leave the call at about uh, 345, 350. Understood. So, uh, so, so Lynn, if you would suspend, Mike, go ahead. Um, thank you. Um, I had in intended to sort of talk first about some of the, the data uh, because I don't think we really have uh, data on current metrics on what's going on out there on rail and bus, but I'll be brief here just to give one example. Uh, we don't have any information on what are the current uh, rail boarding levels at stations and which stations are, are doing better uh, than other stations. Uh, we have no information on um, the various uh, rail lines. Uh, we know generally that the rail 
is at, I guess, about 15% of pre-COVID levels. Uh, but we have no information here on, on whether some lines are, are better than uh, others and, and whether the recovery is happening faster in some parts of the system than others. Um, so that's just a deficiency I see in the data before us. But what I really wanted to talk about is fares and the opportunities to uh, reduce fares, uh, both to stimulate uh, ridership return post Labor Day and a matter of increasing equity. And I want to start with um, slide 35, which Tom was just referring to, which discusses the possible fare changes and uh, fare reductions operation, uh, options, such as uh, the rail bus transfer fee and the reduction or elimination, um, moving to off-peak fares all day, uh, parking fees at free or reduced rates and zone pricing. Um, I think the, the belief that our riders are not price sensitive seems to be based on a large percentage having so-called travel benefits from employers. But these are mainly federal government riders. Uh, from the data we've seen, 58% of riders have fares wholly or partially subsidized by the employer, but we don't know the extent of that subsidy, which have uh, full subsidy and which have only a small part. Um, but the group of federal riders will have very liberal telework uh, opportunities available, we've learned over the past few weeks. So our real rider pool which may be more price sensitive is the 42% with no subsidy plus those in the 58% group that are only partially subsidized. And I think even our rail riders that earn over $100, which apparently staff believes are, are, are those that aren't going to be motivated by a fare reduction, uh, would find a fare reduction and incentives to use Metro Rail uh, fairly attractive in, 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 in making their decision whether to leave their car at home or to just drive to a rail station and park there were it free. So with this lack of compelling data, I continue to support doing a pilot to find out if price cuts will generate a faster return of riders to Metro Rail rather than the 15% we have today or the 34% projected at the end of this fiscal year or even the 50% projected in Mr. Anasecki's one of his options. And I think even for our non transit defended riders, a price cut could help. For those paying $17 today, a day to go from Shady Grove to downtown DC at so-called peak hours with parking, maybe cutting this expense to $770, $385 each way, the off-peak uh, max fare with free parking would make a big difference in terms of driving in with their own cars or using Metro Rail. Indeed, since we have $865 million in federal COVID funds available after FY72, according to slide 12, which Mr. Anaseke presented, I think we can afford to engage in some experimentation to boost ridership. We have very little revenue risk on the downside, I believe. We forecast only $169 million in passenger revenue in a budget of over $2 billion. So for most of FY22, starting July 1, Funding is coming from the federal government, 700 million, or the jurisdictions in the form of subsidy, over 1 billion. So this is a good time to do a pilot that would provide some uh, fair relief. And since we are waiving revenue for the benefit of our upper income, Nats and Skins fans who will have late ending night games and will want to use Metro Rail with increased cost of 100,000 per game, I think we can afford to take some risk to try to offer some reduced fares to most of our, our riders, or those who have been historic riders that we want to bring back. And I think this would also be a matter of real relief for our transit dependent riders as well. Really a real matter of equity. Why are we charging peak fares when there's no peak period? We're at 15% of pre-COVID rider levels with lots of empty cars. As slide six, which Mr. Webster referred to shows pictorially, we have no Metro Rail peak periods today. Why also are we charging riders a premium of $2 to transfer from bus to rail to get to work in a hospital or a grocery store? There's a recently completed study that was done by our inspector general comparing costs and operations at the CTA, the Chicago Transit Authority, with our Ramada. One of the things that that study pointed out is that at CTA, 
of the riders transfer between the bus and the rail system versus only 14% on WMATA. So we essentially have two stovepipe systems, one rail and one bus with very different characteristics in terms of ridership, income, and uh, demographics as well, in terms of minority versus uh, non-minority, in terms of rich versus poor. So I think if we went to eliminate that uh, rust bail transfer, we would also increase the equity of our operation and increase the ability of, of our riders to move back and forth between bus and rail. Therefore, I would again propose, as I suggested last month, a fair relief pilot starting after Labor Day consisting of three parts. Part one, end the peak fares. Have all day at off-peak fare rates, and that would apply reducing the maximum fare from $6 to $384. End the $2 bus rail transfer fee so there is no penalty to go from bus to rail to complete your itinerary to encourage our riders to transfer from bus to rail for the better part of their itinerary on the more expeditious means, the rail system. And finally, I would propose free or greatly reduced parking fees. Those parking fees are now over $5 in the Montgomery County Metro garages. And so to encourage our, our commuters to drive only to Metro stations and ride the rails downtown, I would suggest that we make our parking lots, which aren't very used by very many people since March of last year, free or reduce it down to a dollar for those jurisdictions that require some uh, fee to retire debt. I urge these uh, solutions on the fair side, uh, both as a matter of uh, promoting uh, riders and providing incentives for riders to come back to rail after Labor Day, but also as a matter of, uh, of equity. As I've said before, we have no peak. So why are we charging construction workers and people who are going to NIH, nurses and grocery workers, peak period, far, peak period fares? It makes no sense on Metro Rail. You know, and why are we charging people a $2 fee if they want to go from bus to rail to complete their itinerary? I think these are our concepts that we should do now, and we should take action on them this month or next, so that they will be in effect uh, when riders hopefully start to come back to the system after Labor Day, and we can make this a pilot that would last from Labor Day till the end of the year. I, I've taken up um, more than the amount of time I, I think I was uh, entitled to to start this presentation. Uh, I apologize for having to uh, leave now to do another uh, obligation, but I hope if that's uh, finished uh, early, I'll be able to uh, rejoin the conversation uh, before it ends at, at uh, 4.30. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. McMillan, for uh, giving me this uh, opportunity to uh, state my comments uh, at, this, at the start of this uh, presentation. Thank you again. Glad we got to hear that. And uh, let's resume the presentation now, Lynn. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Lynn Bowersock, Senior Vice President customer service communications and marketing. Um, at this stage in the presentation, we just want you to remind um, the public um, that the board and the staff are working on um, other improvements to service beyond frequency and um, fare options. Uh, those include the platform work that's been uh, done uh, while folks have been um, uh, in pandemic mode and uh, come Labor Day, we will have even more stations um, which have slip resistant tiles and better information uh, in real time displays that are easier to find, as well as charging outlets, which are very popular for people whose uh, phones are, are low on battery. And the next slide you'll see that um, <clears throat> with our bus customers, we're testing new uh, digital signs on shelters. And you see the one there, I think at Braddock Road. Uh, and installing on board uh, new electric buses in the coming year um, to figure out how on the best network, uh, what is the best way to provide real-time digital information to our bus customers. Um, our, our bus uh, riders already have access to some of the real-time crowding information now available that allows them to find buses that are um, less uh, well ridden and um, to social, you know, maintain social distance where they feel more comfortable doing so. 
and that data will be expanding um, over the next several months um, to more sources, including um, uh, third-party uh, apps and, and the mobile app for, for uh, those who download WMATA.com on their phone. And then finally, uh, in addition to the customer experience, obviously we're working hard to communicate awareness about all that Metro's doing um, to make people feel comfortable riding. And um, the um, new ads for the Doing Our Part campaign launched this week, and they really do emphasize the continued commitment that Metro has to COVID safe cleaning and COVID safe practices. Uh, we have not lifted our mask restrictions and uh, we still ask our customers to comply and our employees to comply fully with wearing masks on the system. And that's consistent with the CDC's guidance. Um, we are also uh, adding spots on air filtration because it, our customers find it important to know that air exchanges on buses and trains every three minutes and that we have increased the air filtration uh, in our facilities as well. And so the ad will focus uh, on those facts. And then finally, um, we will have a new bus ad. Lynn, excuse me. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, Lynn. For me, at least, you cut out when you were um, mentioning a very important statistic. I think it was the uh, uh, the air cycling frequency on buses, something like that. Can, could you repeat that statistic you were you were just cited there? Of course, thank you. Our uh, the air exchanges on board buses and trains every three minutes. And that's an important fact for our customers in terms of feeling a comfort level about air handling when riding the system. Uh, and then we have a new bus ad that's coming that will show bus customers using the um, fair payment app on their phones and the uh, crowding uh, data tools um, to when they're riding buses. Again, a way to promote that those tools are available for our bus customers. Um, and uh, the um, when the board has decided what it wants to do in terms of service and fare improvements, we'll launch a new campaign, a welcome back campaign, if you will, in the fall period that really does um, communicate uh, through our stakeholders, through employers, through uh, the jurisdictions using a new toolkit that we're putting together, as well as uh, directly to customers through all means of, of communications channels, exactly what it is the service that we'll be offering come this fall. And so I just wanna thank the board uh, who have been working with the jurisdictions to play the current Doing Our Part ad campaign. And we know it's gotten out there in, in several of them, including on some of the district channels. And we just really appreciate the leadership of the board in helping to amplify that information for our customers. And back to Tom, thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Um, so to, to close here, um, on this slide, uh, we've provided uh, a, a short summary of the uh, anticipated FY22 operating budget uh, implications uh, compared to current budget levels. Um, the service changes outlined here and the, and the concepts outlined here can largely be accomplished mobilizing existing resources within the FY22 budget. Um, and of course, the fare changes have uh, a relatively low uh, near-term cost uh, due to um, the currently uh, low reduced ridership levels. Uh, the long-term impacts of those changes are, um, are very uncertain, of course, and dependent on uh, ridership changes, both up and down um, going into the FY22 and, and beyond. Um, so, Conceptually here, um, we've uh, framed these concepts uh, in uh, two, uh, two steps or, or two buckets. Uh, first, moving forward on uh, service fare items uh, that can be implemented um, this, this uh, summer and fall. Um, and then second, advancing longer lead term items um, and developing options for board consideration uh, as part of the FY23 budget process. And then um, showing these concepts uh, again on in sort of calendar form, um, we do have the existing uh, bus improvements scheduled for implementation in June and um, around Labor Day. Um, and conceptually here, we would have uh, the opportunity to um, move rail uh, to uh, midnight, uh, seven days a week, 
uh, in um, uh, this summer. Uh, so a decision there would need to be made uh, in the very near term in order to allow time for implementation. Um, uh, potential improvements uh, in the uh, all day frequent uh, rail and bus service uh, for potential implementation around around Labor Day and, and, and the fall. And then, of course, um, potentially further improving uh, weekend service um, in, in calendar year 22, uh, co coinciding roughly with um, the opening of uh, uh, Silver Line Phase 2. And um, to close out here, just in terms of next steps, um, so the committee is scheduled uh, to consider uh, service and fare changes, change options for the fall on, on June 10th. Um, there's an opportunity here to consider those options as, um, as, as pilots uh, in consideration of um, Title VI and, and equity analysis requirements. Um, and then, uh, of course, we will continue to support uh, uh, the committee and the board um, with uh, financial budget and, and other analyses um, going into, to, into this next budget cycle um, uh, uh, for both service and fares and, and other elements in the budget. Mr. Chairman, that concludes our presentation. Sorry, it went a little longer than, uh, than we anticipated. Um, appreciate the, the committee's time. Thank you. Understood. We figured it out, and uh, you know, very, very important information that's been presented here today. Uh, uh, for the for my fellow board members, um, I'd I'd like to utilize the uh, raise hand function to call on people uh, as as part of the team zap here. So I will begin my comments, uh, and then well, there's Matt already. So um, uh, we will try to go in order with that uh, to the extent possible. And uh, so um, I'm not sure if this question is best addressed to Tom or Lynn or someone else um, uh, as, a, as a potential measure of uh, whether we've got the right level of service in the right places on, on the bus side. Are, are we able to track, do we track um, uh, customers who, um, Okay, I'm sorry, I had a glitch on my end. Can everyone hear me? Yes, sir. Good, thank you. Apologize for that. Uh, uh, so back to the question, uh, way of tracking um, customers on the bus side who um, are bypassed by buses that are at capacity. I, I, uh, I don't have a good feeling for how much that occurred before COVID how much it might be happening now with reduced capacity on the buses for uh, for distancing. Uh, do we have do we have anything to indicate uh, or an ability to to track that generally across the system or even on specific lines? Uh, Mr. Chairman, if um, if Peter Cafiero is on the line, um, it would be helpful if uh, you could jump in, Peter. Yes, Peter Cafiero, Managing Director of Intermodal Planning. Uh, we do have, uh, we, we do know that there are uh, times where buses pass up customers. Uh, we do have, uh, I don't know that we have full records of how many people were bypassed. We can look into that. We also have uh, WMATA staff that are out in the field uh, observing bus service and noting where it's, it's over and above our, our target numbers. Uh, so we are trying to keep on top of that. We we believe the the numbers decreased significantly when we added a lot of service in August of last year. Although now that ridership has been growing uh, back again, there there is that that risk as ridership continues to grow, which is why we look to continue to add service. Uh, but we'll get back to you to see if there's a better number on that. Thank you. And and uh, at least on my end, you cut out a little bit. What I believe I heard was uh, that we don't have uh, precise tracking of that, indications of it, and and you'll uh, be getting back. Um, it, it's it's obviously not the same as a situation where someone swipes to enter the rail system or swipes to board the board the vehicle. So I, I understand the uh, the uh, ability to uh, get that kind of data is is more limited. Uh, I'll just make a couple general comments about the uh, presentation, the proposal, and then move on to uh, my board colleagues. Um, 
uh, we are all of us operating with, uh, you know, limited uh, information and limited foresight about uh, what demand is actually going to look like in the uh, months and years to come. Uh, we've been given an extraordinarily generous lifeline by the federal government to try to sort this out, to, um, uh, you know, put put service out there uh, and, uh, you know, try to meet uh, the needs of the community as best we can and figure out, um, uh, you know, where we can continue to meet that role in the future. So uh, uh, this seems like a situation where, um, with uh, vaccinations on the rise, with uh, businesses and, and schools making decisions about the fall that uh, uh, we should have um, uh, uh, a, a lot more data, hopefully better and, and maybe even conclusive data uh, as, as we go on later in the year. Um, but certainly, I think there's enough evidence to uh, support um, uh, the, the items that, uh, that the staff has brought forward here on uh, 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 trying to uh, increase the quality of this all-day service, uh, especially on some of these key targeted routes. Uh, the FAIR concepts, most if not all, I believe, are things that the board uh, vetted and was prepared to approve uh, in the last year or two uh, until COVID disrupted many of our plans. So uh, I think those uh, continue to have merit, and uh, uh, I, I think uh, I think it would be wise of us to go ahead and roll those out now. Uh, I, I do. Um, uh, I hear the caution from uh, the staff in the presentation and uh, uh, want to emphasize that, uh, you know, as we go forward, how sustainable um, uh, these uh, fair initiatives and service patterns are is, uh, is, is still a, a very serious question. Um, simply supporting what we're doing now is uh, uh, could not be done without that extraordinary federal assistance. And in a couple of years here, when that is no longer available to us, um, we need to have uh, a service pattern and a jurisdictional contribution uh, uh, understanding uh, that is sustainable. So um, this is something I expect we will continue to revisit uh, every every few months here going forward until we uh, do see um, uh, things begin to stabilize. So uh, in short, um, I, uh, my understanding is that uh, general manager will come back with, um, uh, with the benefit of our feedback today with some very specific actions uh, that uh, will take next month, that will support changes late in the summer. And uh, I, I, from what I understand of them now, I think they're good, and I think I will uh, be endorsing them. So with that, um, I believe the first hand I saw up was Matt, so uh, I will go to you first. Thank you. I'm glad I was uh, quick on the trigger. Um, <laughs> I appreciate all the work to put this together. There's a lot of information here. I think what I will do is just sort of go through six or seven points. Um, and then if staff has a reaction to them at the end or answers for these, please feel free. Uh, but I wanna make sure I, I get through it. Um, just to start with, I think the uh, what jumps out at me is the FY24 budget deficit, um, which remains between uh, basically up to a 200 and uh, 50 million or so, uh, depending on the scenario, between 190 and 250 million. Uh, I'm very cognizant of that as we discuss all this, because the more the more money that we use now to restore service or improve service, the less we will have down the road. And I agree with the sentiment that we're not likely to see um, significant federal funding coming in in addition. So I would tend to take a more conservative approach. Uh, given the fact that we're projected to have a significant budget deficit uh, in the out years. In addition, I would like to examine a little bit more the FY24 ridership projections. I think the 23 ones don't concern me as much. 50 to 55% restored 
in terms of the demand sounds reasonable. I'm just not sure that I see it growing another 20% uh, between 23 and 24. I think we're going to sort of settle into a new normal, and that's going to be sort of what it is with only in incremental growth. So I think the 70 and the 75 might actually be a little bit too optimistic, and I would be curious to see a more conservative FY24 projection, um, which would only increase that, that remaining gap um, uh, which becomes a, a budget deficit. So that's that's a concern. Uh, regarding the, the, the transfers, uh, we did in fact agree to, to implement um, a transfer discount, and I think we should uh, move forward with that. The feedback that uh, Mr. Smedberg and I have gotten from the Virginia jurisdictions is that at this time, uh, as, as you'll recall for, for my colleagues, there's a cost to the other systems when the transfers are provided. And they are not able to provide additional beyond the the dollar that we've discussed um, to go further at this time. So that's uh, an area that we would have concern on. Could we fund though the um, the initial transfer discount using the money that was put aside to help uh, pay for the the, the Silver Line Phase Two um, equity uh, bucket? So that's a, that's an outstanding question. Could that be utilized for this? Um, in terms of broader fare changes in the calendar, um, I would like to see us try to accelerate some of those broader issues. I know we're not getting into those today. I think we're going to have to have subsequent discussions about uh, some of the fare uh, policies, particularly with rail. Um, I'd like to see us shoot for January or February when phase two of Silverline starts rather than waiting for the entire FY23 budget to get to that point. So I see us sort of making adjustments in September as we're discussing and then trying to do another round um, in the early part of uh, 2022. Um, and I think that would make some sense. Um, I am concerned that we are focused a little too much on the existing traffic patterns and drawing conclusions that aren't necessarily going to hold. Um, I actually don't really agree with my friend, Mr. Goldman, because of course, right now, we're not seeing peak period because as, as was discussed, um, the downtown population is way down. A lot of the offices have not brought people back, but I'm not willing to, to bet the farm on the fact that that's not going to change. And I think we will still continue to see some peak. Um, and I think in September and Labor Day, you know, from everything we've heard, there are going to be a lot of private employers as well as government that come back. And they do, you know, even though things might be more spread out, even though there'll be more telework, I still think you're going to see a surge in the morning and a surge in the evening as we've sort of had in the past. So I don't want us to go overboard in, in not accounting for that and still making sure we have adequate service, even if that means needing to scale back a little bit during the day. Um, in terms of the overall bus plans, um, we have concerns in Virginia that what we're seeing is a continuation of what's been happening, which is uh, penalizing the Virginia localities for having existing local service. Um, and you know, increasing frequencies, yes, in a few routes in Virginia, but all you need to do is look at the map and you can see that there's a lot more service in the district in Maryland. And that would be fine, except that the subsidy formula, the subsidy allocation and what everybody's paying is not changing. And so this is going to continue to be a problem. Um, Paul and I have already gotten a lot of feedback from every Virginia jurisdiction about this. And it's a concern that the value is not going to be there for the Virginia jurisdictions as they are asked to pay the same amount and get less service um, or to basically see a reallocation of, of it from, uh, from existing services pre-pandemic to increasing frequencies elsewhere. Um, I think one way in the short term to address this is to bring back some services that were discontinued as a priority over increasing frequencies. Um, we have heard from several of our Virginia jurisdictions that they have been eagerly awaiting for several routes to be brought back that have not been and are not being proposed to be in this plan. We will get specifics as to exactly what those routes are. I know the 16Y in Arlington, uh, which serves Columbia Pike, is one of those routes that um, that has been uh, high in demand that the Arlington officials have received a lot of complaints about not having. So before we see a major uptick in frequency um, and, and you know, overall in the system, we would like to make sure that we're, we're, we are restoring service where it's been cut um, in places that it hurts um, and making sure that we're serving those needs. 
Um, and so we will, as I said, follow up on that. Um, on the on the rail side, um, obviously, you know, increasing frequencies is, is good and fine. I, I, I don't know exactly what it's going to cost. Um, there's a mention here of 100% eight-car trains, and I'm not sure what we're talking about there, if we mean all the time, if we mean during peak periods. Um, do we even have the electrical capacity throughout the system to be able to do that? Obviously, well aware of the fact that we've been upgrading that in some places, but I didn't think all that work was done. So I need more explanation as to you know what exactly that means. So I will stop there a lot, but that's kind of the overall feedback that uh, Mr. Smedberg and I have been getting from our, our colleagues in Virginia um, and my thoughts on some of these issues. And like, like I said, if staff has any any answers for me right now or, or wants to respond, please feel free. Tom or anyone else, uh, any any uh, uh, issues Matt raised that you want to respond to briefly? Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Letourneau. Uh, I, I, I did uh, follow each of your questions in, in top Good. area, and we will um, definitely work with um, with you and the Virginia jurisdictions on uh, on the on the bus service proposals on the eight car train um, uh, your your last point um, because uh, yes we've been working for for a couple of decades now to upgrade the power and capacity and um, uh, uh, rail cars to support um, additional air, eight car trains and operations um, at the frequency levels we're operating today and that are um, contained within this concept. The number of cars we would need in the peak period and the power levels we would need allow us um, or, or provide enough capacity for essentially every train to be an eight car train. Um, if we were to go to higher frequencies than is laid out in this concept here during, uh, particularly during the peak period, we would then start to hit some of those constraints again um, in the power system and storage and maintenance capacity and, and in the total rail car count. Um, so we can follow up with some additional information there, but that that's that's basically what what's happening on that one. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, we'll move on then. The next hand I saw up was uh, uh, Ms. Babers, Lucinda, uh, to you. Great, thank you, um, Chairman. So I just have a couple of um, well, my video kind of started. I just have a couple of questions, um, comments. First of all, I do want to thank you all at WMATA for all of your um, efforts in providing this information. Um, um, we probably do need more detailed um, data and whether or not you have that or not, I, I'm not quite sure. First of all, let me jump in and say that I actually agree with um, Matt's comment that if in fact, we have the data to support it, then absolutely we need to look at um, offering the return of additional routes before we look at um, decreasing um, or increasing frequency. So I just want to put that out there that I would not want um, there to be areas that WMATA serves, regardless of the jurisdiction, where the data shows that there is a need um, in terms of the ridership potential for buses or rail service, and, and we're not providing that before we look at enhancements to service that is elsewhere. Also, I just want to um, state that um, we absolutely do support a return to night service, um, definitely on the weekends to about 1 p.m. on the week um, days to midnight. And what we're finding is we're finding out that our restaurants and our other hospitality areas, such as hotels, which quite frankly, there are about, it's probably about 50-50 in terms of residents who work in Maryland and Virginia that come in on Metro um, that, that work in these industries versus residents that work in DC that work in these industries. But um, we are getting a lot of, um, concerns from resident owners who are saying that, first of all, they're having trouble finding workers. And when they do find workers, if those workers are from Maryland and Virginia, then they're having a hard time um, staying at work long enough 
because they have to run and they have to catch, you know, the last um, train or the last bus. And that's providing a hardship. And of course, those individuals, if they have to take a ride share, that cost is more to them if it's a DC resident and they have to take a ride share. The DC resident, of course, is paying less. Um, so I would definitely, definitely want us to look at that. And then, you know, we also need to look at if we want to get people back. And a lot of these people are um, individuals that are low income and perhaps their, their ride to get to where they need to work requires that um, rail transfer or that bus transfer. We really do need to look at making that transfer free. I do know that prior to me getting on the board, um, there was an agreement apparently of a $1 discount, but I would encourage us to relook at that um, once again. Let's see, only have a couple more. Um, can we, for that slide that was slide 37, that talked about the crowding information um, that is being worked on to be made available to yes. Um, we said that that was gonna be um, available towards the end of um, 2021, but um, you know, I have a question as to, can that be expedited? Because I know that when I got back on uh, Metro, one of the things that I was, you know, concerned about was the crowding. And of course, couldn't tell that until I actually was either in the Metro Rail Station and the train came. Um, and so far, I haven't got back on a bus, but um, but that would be some great information um, for those of us who are looking to ride the rails. And we're still concerned, even though the CDC is saying, you know, social distancing is no longer a requirement. The fact that there's that requirement for us to continue wearing masks on public transit puts in our mind still that there must be some concern still. So I think that that information would be extremely helpful to get people back. So if we can expedite that app, then that would be great. And then um, if we do, because the data is not quite there and we're using projections, I have a question as to whether or not um, if we increase bus service, or or rail frequency and the ridership doesn't um doesn't appear i'm assuming that we can be um very nimble in either cutting that back or in cases of buses redirecting um those particular routes to perhaps some other routes so just want to make sure that we have that ability to be nimble because i know that um we've got union contract um issues when it comes to expanding and then the last comment I have is that I know that the jurisdictions have been um, trying to get the word out through their various platforms in order to win riders back in the During Our Part um, customer campaign. But has WMATA reached out to o o um, OPM in terms of trying to reach out to the federal workers in the area? Because even though they're being given the option to telework in many cases, if 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 they heard and knew about the what things that we were taking in order to improve the safety and cleanliness of um of the metro rail perhaps they would decide that they'll come back in to work or at least maybe three three days out the week or something so i just wanted to know what kind of outreach we've done to the federal government employees That's all I have. Thank you. Uh, that sounds like a Lynn question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, uh, Ms. Babers, we uh, have been meeting with OPM every other week as they develop their return to workplace plans. They still are on um, a very uh, a liberal telework uh, posture. Um, we do expect that there will be some changes, but right now um, they have not acted um, uh, throughout the federal government to impose any one standard. We do know that they're awaiting plans from each department about how best to proceed in a way that um, uh, protects employees and um, continues to serve taxpayers' needs. And um, so we're waiting for those individual department plans to come into OPM so that they can further advise us about um, 
how best to support their workforce. Okay, and then Lynn, I think this is also in your area. Um, do you think that that, um, that crowding, that real-time crowding info app can be expedited? So <clears throat> it is already available through um, open data sources to third-party app providers. And what we're trying to do is um, create more um, usable functionality with other interfaces so that people can get it on their phones. I, I think our own mobile functionality will be ready by uh, just after Labor Day. So I think we are moving expeditiously um, to make sure that it's visible on those other platforms as quickly as possible. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. All right. Uh, next hand I saw was Secretary Slater. You're up. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Chair McMillan. Just kind of a couple of questions. This is a really important uh, conversation because we're really trying to find that balance. You know, it's a balance of you know, making sure we have the adequate resources that are there, but also ensure anything we're doing everything we can to ensure that faster return it's about that comfort level but people counting on us um just i'll go through a few kind of comments and questions i think most of them are probably for uh tom and maybe we can kind of work i'll work through them much like matt did and and just see if maybe tom can kind of address them on the on the back end there you know my first question is really on this kind of slide 28 area here getting to you know if we have a sense of what the ridership levels are today in those equity emphasis areas, because I think they're they're really important. I want to just understand if we're meeting the needs uh, of of those areas today and kind of where that is in terms of how we're we're ramping up. You know, really, uh, you know, it's a fresh conversation for me because we're we're doing very similar things on our Baltimore system. You know, we're looking at uh, really returning to kind of full service on, on commuter bus and mark. Uh, by Labor Day, so end of, end of August. So just trying to think about that. So I do have a little bit of a concern that the option on the longer lead time uh, creates a situation where, where we're just not matched with demand. And, and I don't know that we're nimble enough to be able to kind of ramp up as quickly as we needed to. So maybe if Tom can kind of touch on that a little bit. Uh, and then my question, uh, it looks like a lot of good options really being thought about on the fair side. I do think it's you know, as I kind of listening to the presentation, it's I think it's really a, maybe it's time that we as a board have a conversation on that kind of fair policy principles. I think that you know, seems to be a little bit dated and, and just have a conversation on that and see where that takes us. But uh, in the fair considerations, I, I'm really seeing a big need for some flexibility as we start to understand what this new normal is and what it might be in terms of travel. And I just want to kind of get a sense on the fair side if we've considered adding some flexibility to some of our multi-day passes that can be used on like non consecutive days, those types of things, as people start to figure out what their new normal work week might be, you know, it may not be that typical five day, seven day type of a pass, but they may want to get, you know, 10 or a 15 that may last them uh, for a couple of weeks, but uh, just some comments and, uh, on, on those kind of items for, I think it's probably more Tom for all of them. Uh, uh, thank you, Secretary Slater. I uh, uh, appreciate the, the, the questions and the comments. Um, on uh, uh, equity emphasis areas, so I think a, a, a few things here. Um, you know, uh, what one of the things we all learned during the pandemic, um, uh, or, or was confirmed for us during the pandemic, is that our, our essential workers and uh, many of our, our transit dependent. Um, uh, uh, riders uh, continue to ride or, or resumed riding very, very quickly. And there's a, there's a relationship between um, uh, areas where uh, equity emphasis areas and areas where there are um, uh, transit dependent riders. Um, really the design of this is um, to, to focus the frequency improvements where um, the riders are and where um, we're uh, where we have indicators that there is um, uh, there was demand for higher frequency service in those areas pre-pandemic and now coming out of the pandemic. Um, and so the, uh, we can expand on this further, but I, the, there is very much a relationship between 
um, the design of this, putting frequency where, where the people are um, and where we expect uh, ridership growth could occur, um, particularly during those off-peak periods um, during, during weekdays and, and on weekends. Um, on the uh, fair considerations, yes, um, we're, we're uh, as, as part of this discussion and as part of uh, you know, supporting the board's consideration of, um, of potential concepts, um, the idea of um, non-consecutive day passes or other ways to um, provide uh, some sort of subscription discount that don't require consecutive days, um, th those are all things our, our team has been thinking about and, and of course our industry has been thinking about. Um, so definitely be happy to engage with the board and, and um, the jurisdictions and our customers on um, some potential things there. I think that the time consideration um, as I mentioned somewhere in this presentation, there's um, there are things we can do fairly quickly um, with changing levels of fares within the existing system. Those structural changes, uh, depending on the nature of it, you've got to reprogram the whole uh, the whole back end of the system. So um, as we get a little bit further into those, we can give you a better sense of um, how soon something could be implemented. Um, but we're definitely looking at conceptually at all at all of those things and what might be attractive to customers either existing customers or, or potential new ones. Thank you for the, the comment. Great, thanks so much. I just, you know, I think my my uh, thought process is just making sure that we're there for the region when they uh, really start to come back and, and feel comfortable and confident that, that they can get to where they need to get to through us. So thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, next Chair Smedberg. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, um, just a few comments. I I agree with wholeheartedly with what the secretary just said. You know, we have to be here for the region when they return, um, and that, that is something I know Mr. Wiedefeld and his team is obviously focused on as well. Uh, Tom, uh, Matt has uh, stated uh, many of the things that I was going to uh, ask about or make comments on, so I won't emphasize that. Or emphasize any of them at this point, but a uh, question for you um, as it relates to the bus um, and the enhancements that you're proposing there. Uh, prior to the pandemic, we saw declining bus ridership uh, for quite a period of time. What What is your information telling you about what ridership might be after the pandemic? Or are you just preparing or making these recommendations for the short term. Because once we have service out there, it's gonna be hard to, to pull it back. And I ask that because, you know, honestly, a lot of the Virginia jurisdictions are paying for services now that aren't even proposed to come back. And so I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to, you know, figure out uh, and understand where this is all heading. Specifically as it relates to us right now. Sure, I appreciate that, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for the question. So, um, a, a few things. Um, uh, you know, the bus transformation um, project recommendations focused on a, a few uh, really key areas, um, and uh, as we discussed in this presentation and and, and other settings, um, frequency and reliability of service um, uh, uh, are reported by our customers and sort of intuitive as um, uh, very important to uh, regaining and growing ridership. Uh, so con conceptually here, we're looking at um, improving the frequency consistent with um, the bus service guidelines that the board uh, considered and approved last December. Uh, some of those concepts of frequent and reliable service coming out of bus transformation, um, you're correct. Um, I don't know what bus ridership is, is is going to be in the short term or 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 the long term, yeah. um, but we do have a fairly high level of confidence that frequent and reliable is uh, is going to drive ridership and 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 be attractive to people moving around um, our, our communities in our region. I think the 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 other um, critical piece here, and and we didn't talk about it very much today, but um, uh, priority for bus on roadways. Um, and no matter how many buses we put out there, if um, if as the region's recovering, they get stuck in traffic again, um, uh, it they become again less reliable for customers, and we've got those challenges. So really encouraged to see um, 
uh, across the region, um, efforts in bus priority and transit signal priority and um, dedicated lanes and, and bus lanes. Um, and there have been recent announcements. I think the mayor's budget in, in D.C. includes a very, very substantial investment in um, um, some additional bus lanes. So um, that that those things sort of coupled together uh, make make me optimistic that that ridership will uh, will recover and will grow in in, in areas where uh, metro and the region make those investments. One point Matt made, I, I will emphasize, and that's the uh, transfer uh, discount. I I personally think it's a good idea. I do know that there are some jurisdictions that are concerned about, um, and have even suggested possibly a phase in just to be able to afford it with everything else that's coming down the pike. And you know they don't know what those subsidy totals are going to be after all of this happens. And I think you may have heard about some of this at the JCC meeting. Um, and it would be really helpful to have you know some better sense of what those subsidy totals might be, or if there are any projections there. So they could help, you know, it, it, it'll help them with their, uh, you know, budgeting and um, things moving forward. Um, I do like the idea of some of the things that are on the potential list there uh, in terms of the longer term considerations, um, uh, you know, I, I think could be done sooner than the budget process itself. I think the idea of the passes, as Secretary Slater just mentioned, and maybe one other, I think is is definitely a, you know one giving you know you some flexibility to to do that. I think that's one thing that we could you know definitely pursue if at all possible. Um, uh, also agree with the Secretary on you know having the fair policy principles uh, there, and and in regard to the longer peaks. Uh, you know, I sort of agree with Matt on this one, I, and maybe someone else mentioned it as well. I, I don't necessarily agree with Mr. Goldman either that the peak period is going to go away entirely. Uh, I think it's definitely going to change. Um, you know, we may have a 7 to 10 peak or a 7 to 11 peak or a Monday, Tuesday, Thursday peak. You know, we, you know, you know, who knows what it'll be, but I, but I still think there will be a peak. And I think as we're seeing on the roads and from what I'm hearing, anecdotally from folks is that the afternoon is much more of a peak period uh, than the morning is. Um, morning seems to be more stretched out, but the afternoon definitely seems to be a peak. So that, you know, is something you know, we should consider as well. And um, those are some general comments, but thank you for all the information. I still think, as you said, there's still some information, you know, we need, uh, you know, I, I think it would be interesting, as Mr. Goldman said, to see some of the ridership numbers for the stations. You know, you know, I think would be helpful, um, you know, as, as we move forward here and, um, you know, so it gives us some sort of sense of decision points and factors that you're considering that are informing your recommendations and uh, policy initiatives, you know, moving forward. I think having that background for the board, I think would be, uh, I think would be really helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mr. Spedberg. Uh, before we go to uh, our last board member, I'll uh, just briefly, Chairman's prerogative, I want to comment on a couple of things hit by the last couple of speakers. Uh, first of all, on uh, transfer discount, um, to me, if we're operating a transit system as opposed to a bus system and a rail system, uh, I, I think there's a very strong argument to uh, uh, not just phase out, but uh, 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 eliminate that uh, transfer cost, basically discount it down to zero. Uh, so, you know, when you're on our system, you're on our system. Uh, I know that when we considered that uh, policy a couple of years ago, we did have some pushback from some of the other regional bus operators. Um, not to uh, uh, minimize or dismiss uh, the legitimacy of, of any of those concerns, but uh, I know that uh, some are considering and perhaps getting ready to implement significant fare discounts on their own systems, which, to the best of my knowledge, were um, you know not coordinated or constrained in any way by uh, WMATA's point of view on the subject. So. Um, uh, I, I do think we should listen, but uh, also not feel um, um, 
too many constraints on on uh, going ahead with that policy because uh, I think it does make sense for for our riders who um, need to make uh, not just uh, bus transfers or rail transfers, but actual modal transfers within our system. Um, so uh, anyway, I'll leave it at that and uh, go to Mr. Rouse. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I think my daughter's sucking up most of the bandwidth here, so I'm gonna keep the camera off so I don't freeze. Um, but uh, just a couple points to make as well, and, and many of them have already been made by the other board members here, but uh, just a couple. You know, first is I want to reinforce this idea of, of using data and trends that are outside our normal perspective when it comes to traditional ridership data and other things that we looked at. I think you know, certainly challenging times call for more innovative approaches, and this is an opportune time to try to reinvent how we measure different metrics that might drive ridership on either bus or rail. At the end of the day, there's still, you know, a couple core questions. Why are people traveling? You know, when and where are they going? And uh, what's driving their modal decision at the end of the day? Um, and there's, you know, that's not a one size fits all answer ever. It's, it, it evolves and changes. And I think really any good modern transit system should always be asking that question as networks evolve, um, you know, travel patterns change or, you know, employment areas move around. Um, so I think that's important is, is keeping grounded on those core questions and, and trying to look for data sets that help us see into why people are making the decisions that they're making and where we fit into that and how we can best position ourselves to uh, you know, call it win back riders or just you know, attain some of those riders in the first place. Uh, second, I, you know, we shouldn't presume that we can always extrapolate from the data either. And I think that's that's important. And to Mr. Goldman's point, I mean, there's certainly situations that call for pilots. And, and I do think this may be a good opportunity to run a couple pilots if, if it's warranted and the board decides that that's uh, comes to agreement on some different things that we want to try out. It, there's no real way to replicate real world data in a situation like this uh, than sometimes just trying to see what the response would be. And uh, I know that's easier said than done. Uh, from the operational side, um, and I'm you know so certainly respectful of that fact. It's not something that you can just change on a dime. You can't just throw up new fare you know boards and things of that nature. There's there's certainly thought that goes behind it. So we need to make sure if we do that that it's well thought out and and we know what variables we're trying to test and what we're actually trying to prove by running that pilot. But I do think certainly there's only so much you can get from existing data. Sometimes you have to if you're trying to in particular, look at uh, any induced demand that might be available out there. You, you have to sometimes get real world data and, and, and experiment, right? Uh, but I also think it's you know, a point that's been raised a couple times in line with that is that we have to view the network as an integrated system, not separate services, right? And I think that's that's something that I, a lot of people have touched on, and that's that's critically important, especially when you're competing with you know, auto travel in general, and, and just the the convenience factor there. I mean, that's, we have to consider this. We cannot have uh, seg separate services and, you know, the transfers between them having different fare structures, things like that. Um, although Matt, you know, certainly raises a very good point in how do we address transfers between other providers? Because really they're they're part of the network too. And uh, I think that's, that's a question we have to look at and answer uh, in the long run. Uh, and again, it's not it's not necessarily about winning back previous riders, although that's important. We want those riders back, but we shouldn't lose sight of any potential rider. And sometimes we become so focused on ways we used to do things and what historically drove people to get on Metro that we lose sight of just thinking about things in a new way and being innovative and getting any ridership basis that's out there that's wanting to come on. And so this is a time to continue to look outward and say, again, what drives people's decisions and how do we fit into that? Um, I'm okay with the, the concept that was thrown out there in terms of more consistent all day service. Uh, I do wanna note, I think Tom, your, your point in your presentation wasn't that peak service would go away, but it would just look different and that we should consider the benefits of, of a more consistent all day approach versus a more peak driven approach, but that doesn't necessarily uh, 
presume or preclude the ability to run more capacity at peak times if the data warrants it. Um, so if that's if I interpreted that correctly, I do think that's that's something we should certainly consider. Uh, and as a model that yeah, other other transit agencies I believe have followed is looking at okay, how do we provide a consistent level of service, and and how does that relate to what's going to happen in the future, right? I think a lot of people have brought up the potential that we move to a more spread out rush hour and, and very different travel trends. And so that more consistent all day service may support that better than than anything else we can do. Um, and yeah, if, if the needs for the peak service are there, certainly if we have the ability to address that, um, I think that was a point you were making and that we would have the capacity to increase service and, and capture those or and, and provide service for those people. Uh, I'll leave uh, on the, the fair policy. You know, I, I do agree with the uh, the chairman's point that we've approved many of these issues already. So I think for the short term implementations anyways, that we should go ahead and, and act on those. Uh, as far as longer term considerations, again, I think this is something I've brought up previously, but that's we need to always keep in mind the total cost. And I think we, we sometimes fall victim to looking at specific items and the cost of rail service, the cost of bus service. But again, if we look at it as an integrated system, that includes everything. That includes transfers to buses, that includes parking at a lot somewhere and getting on. So total cost is, is vitally important to most people when they make that decision. I think we need to consider that for whatever we do in the fair policy realm. So, that's all my points, Mr. Chairman. I'll turn it back over. Thank you. And uh, I, I had, uh, we've done one round with every member of the board. I did have a uh, request from uh, Mr. Letourneau. He had one additional point. I'll make one additional point, and then if I don't see other hands, then uh, we'll we'll go ahead and close it out. So, Mr. Letourneau, go ahead. Yeah, I promise I'm not going back through a whole other litany. It was just one thing that, that popped in my mind that um, maybe could bridge, bridge, after listening to everybody, that could just maybe bridge the gap between some of the things that, like, Michael suggested and then maybe where I was, which is not as, as enthusiastic about sort of short-term promotional kind of stuff. But I think one way to approach it could be doing like a one, three, or seven day pass at a discount. Um, so it's a discount just on the pass um, as sort of a promotional, you know, come back to Metro type of thing in September. And that way, I think you avoid some of the, you know, you've given people a, a fair discount and then you raise it back up type of thing. Um, but you encourage them to take a certain number of trips. So I'm just going to put that on the table as a way to sort of do something. Um, uh, kind of on the promotional side, uh, but still kind of be something that I would be comfortable with. So just want to throw that out there. That's all for me. Okay. And so um, uh, to the staff, uh, if you would uh, please look at whether that's something you consider a practical near-term option or something that would require a uh, longer uh, lead time to, to execute and um, uh, uh, just fold that into your thinking as you um, come back to us with the specific recommendation for June 10th. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, if you have any other feedback, you can give Matt, please do that. Uh, the, the last point I want to make, uh, since several of my colleagues here have uh, talked about peak off peak, uh, I just want to uh, reemphasize something that uh, uh, the, the terminology we use tends to obscure. Um, every ride taken by everybody in our system is subsidized by the taxpayer, local and or federal, uh, especially federal at the present time. So, uh, you know, if, if one thinks of peak fare as a surcharge, that leads you to one type of analysis. If you think of off-peak as a discount, uh, and an even larger trip subsidy than one receives when they get a peak period subsidy for the fare that they're paying, uh, that would lead you to uh, perhaps different conclusions. So, uh, you know, the, the, the pricing that makes sense uh, at various times of the day is partly a function of the level and quality of service and frequency of service provided, um, but it's also a function 
of uh, some combination of uh, ridership maximization and revenue maximization. And, uh, you know, certainly in normal times, you have uh, a much uh, less elastic demand at those peak hours, and therefore the um, uh, ability and and uh, uh, necessity in looking at uh, our overall financial picture to charge your high fare during that time and then to um, uh, try to get uh, as many riders as possible off peak uh, into those uh, partially full vehicles that we're uh, running anyway just to maintain um, uh, reasonable frequency levels. So uh, I don't think uh, certainly in the near term, that the concept of peak and off-peak is something that should be abandoned. I think it makes sense. And, uh, uh, you know, our, our calculus of what's the right fare level and what circumstances uh, may be getting more complex as ridership patterns change, but certainly the notion that we should uh, factor in demand in, and uh, the need to raise revenue uh, from uh, to support uh, the rest of the system is relevant and uh, something that should go into those fair decisions. So uh, with that, I believe we have exhausted. Mr. Uh, Chairman, I, um, Mr. Chairman, I just have another comment. Yeah. Okay. If I could, you know, I, I was thinking, uh, you know, hearing everyone talk about integrating the, particularly your comments and Mr. Russ's comments about, you know, we want to in, ultimately integrate this system and make it, one seamless thing, whether it's metro or uh, you know a regional uh, bus system in this case, uh, but that takes technology. And I know the region is something maybe Tom, you know, we put on the list there longer term. But I, you know, I think it's a fair statement. I've heard often from folks that you know they are really looking to Wamada for leadership in this area uh, to help lead that integration. And, uh, you know, I, I think that's ultimately going to be a very important piece to, to have that kind of a seamless uh, transfer between bus rail or rail to bus or, you know, whatever it is. So just wanted to make that comment. Thanks. Uh, very important point. Uh, okay. So with that, uh, I will close discussion on this item. And for the information of the board and the general public, uh, the plan is for the general manager and his staff to take today's comments, uh, return at the next regularly scheduled Finance and Capital Committee meeting, and um, provide us with specific uh, service and fair proposals uh, uh, for uh, the committee consider for uh, action and adoption. So uh, with no further business to come before the committee, we stand adjourned, and thank you all for joining us today.